It's been a few months since our last episode, but here at the GI, we haven't stopped tracking the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on organized crime around the world. As the rest of the world shut down, the adaptability and agility of criminal markets has been clear to see. They found new routes for illegal commodities from drugs to people. My name is Jack Megan Vickers and welcome to this special episode of The Impact, Coronavirus and Organised Crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. In this podcast, my colleague Lindy Umtungana speaks to the Director of the GI, Mark Shaw, and Deputy Director Tuesday Rotano about their new book called Criminal Contagion, How Mafias, Gangsters and Scammers Profit from a Pandemic. Enjoy. It's strange to think that this time last year, we were starting to get used to what it means to live through a pandemic. Uh, Flights were being canceled and grounded, and we were being told to stay put in our homes. Um, And that was for individuals, but of course it affected businesses, it affected governments across the world. But what about the underworld? Paint us a picture, if you will, and I'll direct this question at Tuesday. Um, Paint us a picture of how criminal markets were impacted in those early days of the pandemic. Thanks, Lindy. That's a great question. I think a lot of what we saw in those very early first days as all of the shutdowns began, the underworld very much mirrored the upper world because, of course, criminals were adapting too. They had the same fears as other human beings, worried about getting sick worried about how to ensure that they were in the right place to manage their own families, their own logistical businesses. So there was definitely a pause in a lot of the illicit markets that we first saw. Drug markets, for example, particularly those which used air routes rather than sea routes, pretty much froze because the amount of air traffic went down. And other illicit markets took a stock take. But that period of freeze was surprisingly short. Um, I think what we would have observed across the board and talking about using our observatories in different continents and looking at across different illicit markets, how quickly it was that organized criminal groups managed to reorientate. I think it was notable that there was a lot in terms of stockpiling of key commodities in some places, but what was really marked was the degree of opportunism. So it was barely days before we began to see things like doorstops, doorstep scammers, the kinds of people who ring on doorbells offering to sell things or, you know, to trying to take advantage, get unwary, unsuspecting people to give them cash for various things. Those kinds of schemes started within days of the lockdowns beginning. And some of them were really funny. You know, we, we document in the book stories of how um, South African local gangs were ringing on the doorbells of generally older people Offer, telling them that they were rep- coming from the government, that there was a risk of contamination of the virus through cash. And so they were told that they had to give over all their cash for cleaning and that w- it would be brought back to them. So people would give, of course, all the cash they had in the house and they never see the cash or the people again. You know, little things like this happened across the world, even in Switzerland, where I live, there was a lot of people posing, criminal groups posing as representatives of the government to still case houses in the same way that they would do previously for the opportunity to come and rob them later, saying that they were there for health checks or sanitation checks. So there there was a lot of general pivot around the coronavirus, but none more market than in cyberspace. So it was really on online markets that the fastest and most dramatic changes were seen. You know, the very quick registration of new domain names relating to the coronavirus emails, phishing emails, ransomware that so fast changed the nature of their message to be more orientated towards the health crisis. We are, of course, still learning a lot about the coronavirus itself. But what we do know is that it is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it was transmitted from animals to humans. A wet market in Wuhan, China, was identified as the potential source of the novel coronavirus. And at this time, this brought a lot of attention to the illicit wildlife trade. Mark, do you think that the spotlight on the illicit wildlife trade impacted attitudes towards this trade and could perhaps change it as a result? Lindy, as you know, in in the book, we explored this issue looking at the available data and interviews that, uh, that we had. And the sense, in fact, that there was a disruption in the illicit wildlife market around on the consumer side. Uh, So some evidence that, in fact, 
uh, consumers were more worried, particularly when there were stories around the pangolin as be, having been a potential bridge um, for for the virus. And so there was a a contraction in in the number of buyers. However, I think two points are worth making on on wildlife markets. The the first is that the really core group of buyers continued in place, and indeed. After the initial disruption that Tuesday spoke about in wildlife markets, the trade continued. So there, 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 there genuinely was a period in which uh, commodities in the in wildlife markets seemed to stop moving, uh, but but then demand uh, picked up again. Uh, and in fact, as you know, and again to reference the South African example, the poaching numbers of of rhinos stopped largely in the period of lockdown, but again, in, in recent months have picked up again. So I think the overall evidence suggests that consumer behavior did change. There's a possibility that the number of consumers of wildlife commodities products, particularly in Asia, has declined. Uh, but even that is unclear. And and markets have, have once again uh, been established, grown, uh, or, or, cont- or at least continued. One illicit market that is very dependent on movement is, of course, the drug economy. Whether it's shipments or airplanes or local drug peddlers, they all need to be on the move. Mark, can you tell us how this sector was impacted by the pandemic? Linda, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And in the early days of the pandemic, both our own analysts and ourselves, but also many people uh, working in the drug sector around the world suggested that there would be very big disruptions to drug markets. Uh, the the one exception in our organization, in fact, as the book quotes, is a is a senior analyst called Jason Eli, who's worked for years on drugs and indeed has done some work around previous disruptions in in drug markets. And he was adamant, and and we've used that material and advanced it ourselves, that there would be very little disruptions. Uh, to to drug markets. And one of the reasons for that was that container shipping um, and and the rail movement of goods largely continued and that the majority of drugs in large consignments indeed moved uh, um, through the sinews of of the legal economy. And and so drug flows uh, continued. The one exception to that uh, was uh, drug couriers on on, uh, airlines because commercial airlines had essentially shut down. Um, and so individual, you know, carrying small quantities of cocaine or, or, uh, or other drugs, uh, their opportunities, their channel for movement uh, was smaller. But what we found very, very quickly, and there was some good survey material which we used in, in European contexts, was that in most cases, the prices of drugs on the street uh, changed quickly, but then soon reverted to, to normal. And one of the realities was that there's uh, that stockpiles were drawn upon, uh, that there might have been some disruption, uh, but very quickly, as, as I've emphasized, um, consignments began moving again. One reason for that is that drug networks and drug organizations are such enormously resilient organizations because they've been through a kind of Darwinian ringer. They've had years of focus on them, and so they are very, very adaptable and and uh, and able to withstand uh, shocks like this in 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 quite um, important ways. And so, quite apart from seeing uh, disruption, and and remember to go back and and emphasize that that drug markets over the last ten years, you know, production across a range of drug types, cocaine uh, and methamphetamines in particular, have been increasing. Drug markets just didn't. Uh, see the the uh, the downsizing or the critical disruption uh, that 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 many had hoped for, and that was despite the closing of the night economy, you know, distribution points where where drugs would usually be sold or used. Um, changes, as the book outlines, there were changes in different use patterns of drugs, but overall, the drug economy uh, 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 pretty much surged through through uh, through the pandemic. Your chapter on migration and human smuggling is titled No Escape, No Way Home. Tuesday, tell us a bit more about how the pandemic and subsequent restrictions on movement affected migrants and the smuggling market. 
Thanks, Lindy. I mean, obviously, dramatically, when borders were shut down, airports were shut down, and overall, the message to everyone was move as little as possible and stay home. For an illicit market based around the facilitation of mobility, this was game over to a large extent, and certainly for the first few weeks. I think what was troubling for us was the dynamic that very quickly developed around the migrant smuggling or irregular migration movement that um, politicians began to speak of how essentially irregular migrants, migrants were themselves vectors of transmission. And so it was a much stronger clampdown against illicit migration than it had been before. And this resulted in a number of places, quite aggressive efforts to quell the irregular migrant migration movements. What we know from our studies on human smuggling and human trafficking is that the harder it is for a migrant to make a journey, the more likely it is that they will become vulnerable to exploitation in that journey. So what we witnessed and what our observatory colleagues um, on the field working in the border areas reported was that migrants who were no longer able to continue their journey then became monetized by their smugglers held in place. So there were greater risks of kidnapping or some extortion. There was a greater risk of forced labor and different kinds of abuse. So for us, it was a very troubling scenario that the there was this sense of risk around the migrant populations that made them very vulnerable. Lockdowns and social distancing became the order of the day. and Consequently, we moved indoors and online for our shopping, our business, and of course, socializing with family and friends. Tuesday, tell us how illicit actors moved their businesses online, and in particular, what kind of cyber attacks you noticed over the course of this time, and who was targeted? It was an easy reorientation for cyber criminals to take advantage of the pandemic. They're already designed in a way to be very responsive to political events, to understand that when people are scared, when they're confused, when there's lack of clarity, it's an opportunity to scam them out of something. So it was astonishing how quickly the coronavirus became the thing that the cyber cyber crime community latched onto. There are domain name registrations that monitor the growth of certain domain name brands, if you like. There was a 15,000% increase in ones related to coronavirus, COVID, pandemic, using these kinds of words, trying to sell testing kits, trying to sell services. Again, a very funny story that we documented in the book was one cyber criminal group who started to sell a corona, corona antivirus software that could be downloaded onto your computer, which would protect the user from getting infected by coronavirus, which is obviously ridiculous. But people were scared and they were looking for solutions. And so there was an opportunity to take advantage of them. Another clear vulnerability actually came in the private sector because you know, huge companies, massive multinationals all closed down. They sent their staff home. Everyone was working from home. And so a lot of the corporate firewalls and safeguard mechanisms for their staff were no longer there because everybody was suddenly working from their computers at home on their own modems and their own servers. And so the infrastructure around cybersecurity was very weak. The result, therefore, was a growth in business enterprise um, scams, a lot of things that looked like they should be a normal transaction, and people working from home were encouraged to approve them, which actually was a payment to some form of you know, cyber scamming website or to a criminal group. And what the um, watchdogs, the corporate watchdogs noticed is the size of these business enterprise schemes very quickly started to go up. So where the average may have been around ten to $50,000 before, it was going up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars where stressed workers working from home, distracted by the fact they were schooling their kids online, were making what seemed to be routine transactions, but actually just sending money into the hands of criminal groups. A particularly worrying trend that's emerged in this rise of cybercrime is related to child sex abuse material, which you track in your book. You mentioned that prior to the pandemic, there were about 46 million unique images falling into this category, but that since the pandemic, there's been a 200% increase in such posts. Tuesday, how vulnerable have children become during this pandemic? And do you think that this is a trend that could ever be reversed? The common wisdom seems to be from the different police organizations that it was the growth in peer-to-peer -peer groups that share graphic content about children 
will be an irreversible trend. So they documented very quickly that they were seeing um, a growth in the size of the groups, a growth in the speed at which pictures were being uploaded and downloaded of you know relatively substantial proportions. And that's over the course of monitoring the, the sub last year that these have not gone back to normal. The other thing that was it was clear was taking place is a growth in online um, sexual exploitation. So the use of live sex acts through uh, video feeds. Um, we have colleagues who work on human trafficking and child sexual exploitation through our resilience fund in countries in Asia where this is very prevalent. And they documented a growth in vulnerability because using your children for sex became a way of smoothing income holes that the pandemic itself was creating. So families who had lost their incomes because factories were shut or commercial business was sh shut needed to find other ways to keep their families afloat. And so putting their children online whilst there were people moving around their communities trying to recruit became a massive vulnerability. What also occurred, of course, in parallel is that the safeguarding mechanisms that would usually alert to, to human trafficking or the growth and growth and victimization were very much broken down. So the kinds of first points of contact, social workers, uh, community policing, and maybe even those you know, banks and other places that would say, oh, look, we're seeing something which might be suspicious. Those were removed in the pandemic because everyone was at home. So the outreach systems that should protect victims had gone. The vulnerabilities, the underlying vulnerabilities that generate it situations of exploitation and abuse had increased because incomes were down, because people were trapped at home and under low surveillance. So all in all, it was a horrible, perfect storm to enable a growth in, in sexual exploitation online. Tuesday, how difficult is it to police crimes that happen online? Thanks, Cindy. Again, an excellent question. It's always been hard. The internet and communication technology is moving very quickly. It's very well resourced. It's very lucrative. Um, and it's, it has a very strong feedback loop, actually. There's a lot that's been documented about how facilitatory the online cybercrime community is in developing its services for others to use. There uh, have been reports from McAfee and others that have described cybercrime as a service where you actually have hotlines and support networks for want-to-be cyber criminals who are ready to break into the industry. And cyber criminal groups use their skills to develop quite easy, quite cheap download packages, which would allow anyone to become a fraudster, a scammer, or a digital uh, con artist. So this being a, you know, a very effective, very fast moving, and a very fast evolving industry has been an enormous challenge for law enforcement. The police rarely have access to the same level of highly skilled IT professionals that would be needed to counter it. Equally and generally, if somebody has those skills, there's a far more lucrative profession to be found in the private sector than there is to be working for a national police agency. Secondly, the pandemic itself created conditions that made it harder for policing. Mark, I'm sure we'll speak to this later, but in the same time as everybody else went home and went to work from home, so did a lot of police, police organizations and the kind of cross-border structures that are required to police cybercrime. Cybercrime, because it's by nature multi-jurisdictional, it's not a national problem, requires a degree of international cooperation. And while there are a growing number of, sort of international cybercrime centers, Europol has one, Interpol has one, that facilitate that kind of exchange between different law enforcement agencies to try and counter cybercrime, that challenge was made more acute when everybody was working from home, everybody was focused on domestic law enforcement priorities. And then, of course, the final challenge is how much takes place on the dark web. And particularly around this issue of child sexual exploitation, which we were just discussing, file sharing of child content is often within quite discreet peer groups. They meet and they discuss, they build their communities in the dark web where it's very hard to monitor, and they become quite agile at opening and closing down their various sites. So it's an enormous challenge at the best of times, and COVID only made it more difficult. Now, turning to corruption in the healthcare system, Mark, already in the book, it states that globally, an estimated $500 billion of healthcare spending is lost to corruption every year. How did this change or evolve over the course of the pandemic? I think the first point to say is that in many countries around the world, notably Italy, for example, uh, organized crime was already relatively well embedded into the health system. 
So when there was a ramping up of expenditure, as the book notes, uh, criminal, criminal groups, criminal networks, many had inside information, it depended on the country, and were able to move uh, relatively quickly. So you, you see, and we try to track it in the book, you know, the multiple cases that were being exposed in the media in almost every country around corruption in the healthcare system, around PPE, et cetera, as uh, expenditure was ramped up, that the, the barriers, if you like, for signing contracts between governments and, and, uh, and contractors were lower um, and, and organized crime be, became involved. And so I think we think, as, as you know, uh, concluding that what the pandemic has done in some countries has buried organized crime interests even more fully uh, into, into the very lucrative healthcare sector. And looking at something that, uh, or at least picking up on something that Tuesday had mentioned about how everybody went home, and this included, you know, experts and, and people working in spaces of safeguarding and law enforcement. Mark, it's clear that organized criminal groups adapted very, very quickly in the wake of this global emergency. But to what extent were governments and even the international community able to respond just as fast to organized crime? When we began writing the book, we were speaking to our networks of so both researchers and analysts and then people in law enforcement agencies, both in seminars and, and individually. And, and one of the things that started to you know, emerge very quickly, I would say, were three things around law enforcement. The first was that many police officers were getting sick and the infection rates in some police agencies were very high, over 50%. And of course, the reason for that, that police officers were engaging directly with the public, they were often uh, engaged in public order in the first days, etc. And so the the levels of infection were were high. And of course, you know, policing is is a very physical business. So you are you're mixing with your colleagues, etc. And so uh, in the book, uh, we recorded where police stations closed down. And there's just a long list of countries and number of police stations and headquarters and other places where which were shut down to, to prevent the further the spread of, of the virus. Secondly, the ordinary business of policing ground to a halt. So investigations stopped, uh, organized crime investigations uh, slowed and in some cases were uh, uh, simply stopped or put on hold for some time as police officers were transferred to other duties, as retired police officers were, were brought back um, to assist the process. So there was this huge disruption um, that, uh, that, that took place in, in the process of policing. And the third point I think that, that drew out from our interviews was the enormous frustration of senior police leaders in this period. Very, very few, if any, police agency had a plan for this kind of eventuality. Uh, there were other plans in places around you know, major environmental or other disasters, uh, but, the, but the pandemic, uh, despite the fact that there had been a sense that it was predictable, uh, it, it, you know, it had, people had been writing about it, very few state security agencies had plans in place to be able to uh, respond effectively. So it led to this disruption in, in uh, criminal justice. What occurred over time is two very interesting things, as we note in the book. The, the first is the degree to which courts moved online, not immediately, uh, but over time, uh, 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 courts uh, and court processes moved uh, uh, into the virtual space. And that's both good and bad. It, it, in some countries, it gave more access, more publicity, more transparency. In others, it restricted it. But it's a shift that, that I suspect will, will continue. That, uh, in, that in some places, at least, virtual court hearings will be a way in which uh, issues of distance and security can, can be circumvented. And then the, the really important issue from our perspective was in prisons. And, and of course, prisons being concentrated spaces with lots of people living closely together uh, were identified early on and correctly as a place where the virus would potentially spread. And in a large number of countries, uh, prisoners were released. About 10% of the world's prison population actually was released in the context of, of COVID. Now, most of those people were low-level offenses or uh, offenders or people awaiting trial and, and the like. Um, and in, in many countries, those are low-level drug 
uh, 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 offenders who who often block up systems given the, the degree to which the drug economy, if you like, uh, jams up criminal justice systems. And we hoped or wondered whether that would lead to some long-term reform around managing prison populations. Uh, you know, the, the, the world didn't fall over because uh, so many prisoners were released, although the argument is actually not enough for, uh, um, uh, uh, prisoners were released. So, you know, we, we will wait and see how, how this particular area unfolds. And then, and the book documents this in a number of cases in Italy, in Brazil, etc. There was a big debate around the release of aged mafiosos, so senior organized crime figures, and, and a, you know, a very big discussion, uh, big local news around whether this was appropriate under the circumstances. And all of this meant enormous disruption, which to some degree we are only in many countries beginning to recover from now um, in, in the context of, of, uh, of policing organized crime. So disruption to front-end law enforcement, uh, a disruption of ordinary police service uh, as police stations were closed and police officers maintained space, and then discussion or, or disruption of sort of harder core organized crime focused investigations. And an interesting uh, development that you also track in your book is the role that some organized criminal groups or gangs began to play during the pandemic, whether it was Mexico or South Africa. They started engaging with communities, providing social services and support even. Um, there is somewhere in your book where you say that relying on the moral compass of criminals uh, might not always be the best idea, but they did serve an important role. What do you think might be the impact of this, the role that gangs played in local communities, um, the impact of this in the long run? For us, because the Global Initiative has a lot of researchers and people working in gang-related spaces, we began to get information around this early on, actually just when we were deciding to write the book. And so there's really a number of points to make. The first is, of course, that gangs have been providing social services for as long as they have existed because their focus is to uh, try and obtain local forms of legitimacy. So in previous cases, whether it's earthquakes or, or whatever the case might be, gangs did step into into the, the the space where the state had retreated, if you like, and and gangs did some interesting work in the early days of the pandemic. Firstly, they did hand out uh, food, uh, money, etc. They were quite careful to advertise that, and we were following some of those things on Facebook and elsewhere. So so gangs providing soup kitchens in in uh, in particular areas, etc. Secondly, in in particularly in Brazil more hardcore cases, they helped enforce the lockdown where the, the sense was that the state was tardy around that or frankly didn't care about excluded people in, in gang-held uh, areas. And in Brazil, there was this interesting differentiation between militia groups who rely on extortion and, and gangs who rely more on the drug trade. And, and for militia-style groups relying on extortion, closing businesses, shutting down the economy was clearly bad. Uh, for, for gangs relying more on the drug trade, uh, it, it, the, the economic costs of, of maintaining or enforcing the, the, the shutdown were, were lower. So in this complex space, then, I, I guess to answer your question, is the sense that gangs gain greater legitimacy. And there was a mass of media coverage around this, all of which we, we tried to follow. And our sense was that in some cases it was exaggerated, that the sense was gangs, the role of gangs had been in fact talked up that gang bosses were very eager to uh, to show that they were delivering better services than the states. But at the same time, they then became too visible. They then became a target for state action uh, when, when states were very sensitive about being seen as not being in control of, of, of certain areas. And so in some cases, Facebook uh, you know, posts, et cetera, were, were taken down and they tried to calibrate uh, their, their response. I would say overall, that COVID provided some space for the continued growth of gang legitimacy, gang occupation um, in a number of, of cities uh, uh, around the world. Our sense is that shouldn't be exaggerated either, that in fact state power in some places grew often in quite a clumsy or clunky way as the state tried to um, uh, regulate, uh, uh, regulate lockdowns. I think the issue with gangs is that 
gang bosses really from early on saw this as an opportunity and then calibrated, if you like, uh, what, what they were trying to do in an attempt to buy legitimacy for the longer term. So Tuesday, in the ways that uh, gangs stepped in to fill in the gap um, where government had failed to provide certain uh, social services, loan sharks similarly were there to support people financially. What do you think the impl implications of this might be in the long term? I think we're all recognizing that the vulnerability of the economic environment is one of the longest tailed or likely to be one of the longest tailed weaknesses and vulnerabilities of the pandemic. It was dramatic the extent to which the economy contracted because of the lockdowns where, you know, so, so many sectors and the sectors that were dependent on them were instantly frozen. Entertainment, nightlife, restaurants, travel, tourism, and then all the collateral services that provide for those industries, transport. Um, you know, we had an example that opened one chapter just about the flower industry, for example, you know, all of these beautiful flowers that should have gone for weddings, that should have gone for conferences and on cruise ships and into every kind of event. That entire industry collapsed completely over the course of the year because nobody was doing them anymore. So this impacted on businesses and impacted on the individuals employed in those businesses. I think in the Western world, people were lucky. There were often government furlough schemes or support provided during the pandemic. But the majority of the world didn't have that kind of social safety net. So people went almost overnight from having a job to not having a job. And at the same time, perhaps seeing an increased need to buy PPE to try and access medical care if one of their relations fell sick, or just generally to keep food on the table and things moving forward. So economic need was palpable during the pandemic. And if governments weren't providing, and even if they were providing, they weren't necessarily capturing any everyone, or to the extent to which needs had arisen. And so, you know, there was a lot of talk about the gig economy, for example, and how they failed to access um, the kinds of social security payments that were being made in emergency measures, that um, smaller businesses would not receive the same level of assistance. There, and there was a lot of abuse of those systems as well. Um, that these points of vulnerability were unquestionably filled with criminal money. The Italian mafia was you know, noted and recorded is just hanging outside of banks, waiting for people who came out having had a loan application refused to offer them money. And then the offer of money comes with maybe a low interest rate to start with, but that can be hiked up very quickly. And the collateral put on the table in those kinds of arrangements is, is violent. It's somebody's life. It's you know damage to their property. It's a threat to their children or their wives or their families. So it's, it's a really troubling dynamic which creates a lot of power for criminal groups and the challenge as you begin to see this go on is that when businesses fail and it's a key sort of facet of extortion based uh, enterprises that they try and hit a point where they're taking enough of the business that the business can continue and make those regular payments but not enough to ever be profitable and ultimately a certain point businesses fail and now having seen such a long cycle of lockdowns in the tourism industry, particularly being so depressed, who buys those businesses? It's again, criminal money. They are more liquid than many of us. It's a cash-based economy, huge sums of money that just get poured into the vulnerable businesses, the vulnerable families who are then assets for the future. So everything I think we see in terms of the fact that we know that bankruptcies themselves have quite a long tail. You'll see bankruptcies continue in waves over the next three to five years. That will be such an enormous long-term vulnerability and a point of penetration for criminal enterprise into the legitimate society and economy. When it comes to the coronavirus, we're trying to prevent it or treat it with vaccines and other social and healthcare measures. But what about organized crime? How do we recover from it? And how do we stop it from taking such a strong grip again? I think we can both probably contribute to that answer. I think what I saw at least was the extent to which key, there's a very low level of trust and information, which allowed for a lot of the scamming and a lot of the confusion and the, and the quick ex exploitation of vulnerabilities in this public health crisis. What was notable to me was that when you looked at the analysis, for example, around 
how information was being disseminated in the pandemic, celebrities were a far more effective source of information dissemination than trusted government websites, the WHO, the NHS, or whatever example you want to take. You know, one silly celebrity tweeting something which said, you know, we support this ridiculous therapy of snorting, I don't know, baby powder to protect yourself from the coronavirus, that had a far larger amplification effect than the WHO's very serious press releases that provided information. So one of the challenges I think we needed to do was build up and create some integrity around information dissemination. The other thing that was very clearly a vulnerability during the pandemic was cyber attacks against part of the systems that would be critical in a public health emergency. So education institutions, research institutions who were working on, you know, trying to identify and then, and then build a vaccine, they were the highest targeted for cyber attacks during the pandemic. Hospitals, health systems also were hit repeatedly by wave after wave of ransomware, where you saw, for example, the entirety of the patient's record system locked down unless the hospital paid a ransom, you know, $15,000 or something like that to have those released again. Patients died because there was no access to the patient records when they needed them. It is, you know, we've documented cases of the fact that people who are meant to be transferred from a regular hospital to an intensive care ward were not transferred in time and they died because the hospital was under attack. And there were ransomware attacks against hospitals and on, against research institutions that were very well timed towards specific announcements of, say, a disbursement of funding or a key breakthrough. So I think, you know, here we're seeing the results of 10 years worth of massive underinvestment in the cyber security of the kinds of institutions that we would rely on in a public emergency. But Mark will give a different answer to that question. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the one thing that I think is important for the book is that we started early on, as you know, looking at the trajectory of organized crime from around 2000. And, and we tried to do that deliberately, partly out of our own frustration in the, in the years running up to the pandemic, the enormous growth of, of criminal markets around the turn of the millennia, you can really trace the, the global upswing across a range of, of markets. And really the this, the sense that the tools that the global community have in place, there's a convention, there's, you know, Interpol, there's cooperative mechanisms, we're really not doing very much to stem the tide. And that the market demands of, uh, of a range of illicit commodities, be they drugs, wildlife products, etc., was just relentless. And the pandemic, in a way, similarly to the, to the illicit market, I suppose, uh, uh, has had uh, sort of accelerated some of the changes that were already underway in the system. So the, the most uh, obvious of that is one Tuesday has referred to on, on cybercrime, the sort of moving online of, of a range of, of criminality. But I think it's also highlighted a kind of sense of that organized crime and illicit markets are part of a range of, of global challenges like cli climate change. It's certainly not on the same policy level as, as uh, climate change. One of the reasons is that it's so diverse. Uh, there are so much different illicit activities in, in, in different markets. And so, you know, one of our prescriptions, if you like, one of our uh, proposed cures, and there's, there's I, I think first to say there's no silver bullet to, to reducing uh, illicit markets, but what is required is a much clearer strategic focus on illicit markets as a whole, on criminal groups, on understanding who they are, and a global, better, multilateral response uh, to, to be able to reduce both the level of illicit trade, uh, but also the harms that, that are associated with that. And we recognize in the book, as I think you, you know, that that's quite a tall order, that that requires states cooperating with each other, it requires a much more effective multilateral response, and it requires a recognition that in some parts of the world where, where states have limited capacity, we ne may need new and innovative uh, solutions, including rethinking the economic incentives, so deregulation, if you like, 
around particular criminal markets. We hoped that the, the pandemic is a kind of plastic period, if you like, where there's a lot of policy up for discussion, that some of these debates would become more serious than they have to date. I think the jury is still a little bit out on that, uh, uh, to, to use a criminal justice metaphor. But we still hope that a period of policy change around organized crime, criminality, uh, uh, will emerge in, in, in the coming years. And that will look differently in different markets. But at the same time, there needs to be a global uh, strategic response to some of the challenges that, uh, that we face. Currently, our sense is, and the pandemic, um, the pandemic reinforced that, is that we are losing, that we broadly, globally are not winning the fight against illicit markets. And if you look at any of the data that the book presents across a range of markets, um, that, that we have considered, uh, I, I think you, you, you're bound to, as a reader, draw the conclusion uh, that it, it might be a stalemate, but more likely uh, that, that the overall fight is being lost. So we need the sense of coming together with a much more strategic response in, in the years ahead. And that's, of course, the work of the Global Initiative. Mark and Tuesday, thank you so much for this very enlightening conversation. Thanks for listening to this special episode of The Impact, Coronavirus and Organised Crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Why don't you have a look at some of our other podcast series like Deep Dive, Exploring Organised Crime, which covers all kinds of subjects from the fall of EncroChat, the Encrypted Communications Network, to the terrorist attack in Parma in Cabo Delgado, Mozambique, and what that means for the illicit markets that flow through that region. We also have Africa and the global illicit economy. This series focuses solely on the continent of Africa, from illegal gold mining to corruption and from the assassination crisis to the illegal wildlife trade. The most recent episode was called The Death of Debbie. In that, we looked at the sudden death of Idris Debbie, the president of Chad for three decades, and what that means for the Sahel region where illicit markets have a long and embedded culture. We're all over social media, so just search for The Global Initiative and you'll find us. You could also head over to our website, which is www.globalinitiative.net, where you can find videos, webinars, interviews, other podcasts, articles, and of course, our detailed publications. That's it for the Impact Coronavirus and Organised Crime from The Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.